The first reading today is taken from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you but on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his, this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. For I have risen from the dead. The Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given his, him dominion over the work of his hand. He has, he has put all things under his feet. The epistle reading this morning is from Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who was worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to, began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God 
sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and a golden and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy of you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, for every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on all the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Hallelujah. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah. Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were un not able to haul it in because of the quality or quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garments for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out of the, on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, <coughs> he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you said, to dress yourself and walk wherever you want it. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a text we have today. Do you love me? Question Peter was to answer. He had to answer three times. Recalling and remembering how he had denied his Lord three times. And you notice his answer is a little more subdued. Although he is the one who is a leader of the group. I mean, he's a spokesman whenever it's possible. But in answering Jesus's questions, he doesn't carry that same way of answering when he said that uh, even though all the rest of them be betray you or deny you, I will never. I'm ready to die with you. Seems that Peter is learning that we're really at the, the mercy of our Lord and Savior and his spirit guiding us. But the question, do you love me, really rings and should ring in our ears. Do you love Jesus? Is he your Lord and Savior, your prophet, priest, and king? In the great uh, throne scene that we had read to us today from the book of Revelation, we see that the, the lamb in their midst, the lion of Judah, is worthy. He is the one that's worthy. We certainly are not. He is the one that gave himself to save you and me. And that's important in several respects. It's one of the reasons that you have love generated within your heart. But you have to believe that. Hmm. But faith is not something that I can make. It is something that God develops in me through his Holy Spirit. So even Jesus and our love for him is the development of our faith and trust in God's word. God's word, the instrument by which we receive faith and life and eternal life. I've said before, and I'll say it again, that the word of God is the most important thing that we have. It is what gives us life. It is what will continue to give us life here and now and hereafter in eternity. So our love for Christ is generated because of our trust for him and the knowledge that God loves us 
through what he has done and what God has done, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for us. But then the question still comes back to each and every one of us. Do you love Jesus? Oh, pastor, come on. Anybody can answer that question. He's such a wonderful person. How could you not love him? Hmm. This is not a question of emotion. It's not do I have an affection for him. The question is, do you really love him? Are you committed to him? Do you trust him? Because trust is the thing that is so important. Well, how do I get to that point, Pastor? That I completely trust Jesus. And then I completely trust God because of Jesus. How do I get there? Well, good Lutherans call it the means of grace. It's the way in which God gives us his free unmerited love. Through his word. And through his sacraments of Holy Communion and Baptism. And by participating in all of that and understanding what we're doing and worshiping our God, we develop love in our hearts. For we come to know that God's whole effort is to bring us back into fellowship with him. Now, Jesus said that when he was talking to the woman at the well. You remember the Samaritan woman? He said, God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus is the truth. And it's the Holy Spirit working in our spirit. It means worshiping him in spirit. So as we look at, do you love him enough to make decisions that will please him versus what your sinful flesh would like to do? Do you make decisions because you know that he'll be proud of you and that he cares for you? See, you're not earning anything. Christ has already saved you. He's already done the things necessary to save you from your sin. But when we do good works, they're something that comes naturally from the Christian. Because he wants to do it. Because he knows that's how God is loved. Because it's a spontaneous thing that you want to do. Now, <clears throat> if you're hesitant about doing good works and the like, I think probably the only thing that I can help you with there is to tell you to go back to his word. And see how he has done so many things to save you and to bring you to the point that you are in the present right now. That he's brought you to the point where now you can truly believe in him. And because of that belief in him and trust that you will build in him, you turn around and love him. That saying that we love him because he first loved us in song and in words and in deeds is so true. It took his initiative. It took him doing something. In this case, I want to talk about Peter for a little bit because he makes the example for what I'm trying to, to preach today about. You see, Peter was a big man. And because he was the person who went, put himself forward, spoke for the group, the, the leader, if you would, the natural leader of the group, he had certain advantages. He got to do things his way. But at the same time, he's at a hazard because... 
Well, his pride gets in the way. He's got to do one-upsmanship. How many of us get stuck in that? You see, you don't have to do anything. God wants you to want to do something. He wants you to love it. But he wants you to do it because you want to do it, not because somebody else is trying to force you into it. As a pastor, I'm very much aware that you can get work done using the law. Okay? You should do this and you should do that. But that wears thin very quick. People, because of their sinful nature and the like, and because of my sinful nature, react not necessarily in agreement with what I say you should do. And I've learned over time that the only person I can control is me. I can't control anything else. And I don't really do that so well either. You know, when I start looking at things, I say, why does God love me? I certainly don't deserve it. And yet the fact is that he does. And it's true for each and every one of us that he loves you. So one of the things that I have tried very hard to teach in, a, in the preschool with the kids is that Jesus loves them. And I think that it's actually sinking in that he does. We sing, Jesus loves me. We point at, each, at ourselves. And then in the end, we say, Jesus loves you. Um, but I see it in the reactions afterwards, too. And uh, it really adds a lot of energy for my life to see that kind of reaction in the children. And hopefully, first learning is lasting learning. We work so hard, but we don't know what really it is that affects us. You look back through your lives and the things that have happened in your lives. Do you see the hand of God loving you? Putting up with you when you're at your worst? Celebrating with you when you're at your best? Because that's what he's been doing. He's raising you up to trust him, to live in his kingdom, to witness to his love for you. That's what this is all about, this life that we have. God's will is that you love one another. God's will is that you are saved. God's will is that we worship him. God's will is certainly stated in the Ten Commandments, each and every one of them. That's what he wants. The problem is our sinful flesh. We don't do so good at that. Yet he continues to love us, and he loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son. And I underline that only begotten son because there was only one Christ, only one way to salvation. And in fact, he's the one that declared that. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I heard here this last week uh, another evolutionary theory. And in that evolutionary theory, they're making the whole universe or especially the earth, the evolving living thing. And they show how the earth corrects certain problems with the environment and the stuff by the way it reacts to things. And they would put it forward and show all the beauty and interconnection of everything and make that they're God. That's really sad. Because 
what they're saying is true. They're just not giving credit to the right person. God put it all together in such a way that it maintains itself. That he's done such a marvelous job that even when we make a mess of it, it gets corrected. But it's God who did that. The creator, not the thing that was created. I heard somebody questioning and talking about the evangelicals. And it's talking about one of their colleges, their supposed largest evangelical college, where the kids were there. And one of the side comments was, yeah, and they actually believe in a, in a six, uh, 6,000 years is Earth's age. Well, there's some very pretty intelligent people that, that thought that, at least at the time of Neil Armstrong, when he landed on the moon, uh, they expected, given the time that they had said the Earth had been evolving, that uh, sinking into the moon dust, they'd sink probably about 36 to 38 inches. They had it all figured out mathematically and everything else. And so they put these big pods on so that they wouldn't lose the thing in the moon dust. Well, it only sank about 16 inches. If I remember the back then, but they figured that the, the amount that it sank into the moon dust would only count for about six to 10,000 years. So maybe, just maybe, <laughs> they really don't have it even close to right. I know that this earth has been distorted by the Satan himself. He doesn't make much, but he destroys all that God has made and he would try to destroy the order that has been given it. He would destroy you and consume you and me if it wasn't for Christ. You know, the only thing that we can really trust is God, what he has done and what he has made known to us, how what he has revealed. We have no idea yet really about how this is all put together. Oh, we continue to work in our science. And the problem with it is that we keep thinking that we're so smart. But the moment we start thinking we're smart, we got a handle on this, we're proven wrong. So our pride gets in the way of our salvation. And I'm talking about our, the world, the people in it. Now, there should be no question to in, in uh, today's age that evil exists and that the devil exists. But people will make fun of it and say, oh, you know, that's some superstition. Tell me, if evil doesn't exist, what's going on over in Ukraine right now? What went on during the Second World War? How in the world can you say that there's nothing evil? St. Paul tells us that we fight against spiritual, spiritual powers and principalities. It's not so much people as what drives them, what has influenced them, what is controlling them. Well, who do you want to be controlled by? Personally, I want to be controlled by God, by Jesus Christ and his spirit. I love him because of what he has done for me. I love him for what he has done for you. And the life that he has given has meaning only if it serves his purpose. You see, if we live just for ourselves and how much we can consume, we die. 
And just because we have more toys doesn't mean that we won. It means we got lost in the toys normally. Life is about living for God and being approved by God. Being able to live with him here and now and hereafter in eternity. And Christ has made that possible. So do you love him? I hope that inside of you there's a voice that says, you bet. But then I hope there's a reality that says, well, maybe I need to work harder at that. Maybe I should let his spirit really control me. You know, Jesus said, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep and tend my sheep. He's talking about his church and he's talking about the children and he's talking about the adults. And do you notice that in this whole story, what does Jesus call the adults? The ones who are the leaders. He says, children. You see, we're all children, children of God. And if we would compare ourselves with him, we should realize very quickly that we are just simply little children who are living and enjoying life and enjoying his love. Because he first loved us, let us certainly love him. Amen. The peace of God with passeth all understanding. Keep our hearts and minds in true faith until life everlasting. Let us depart in his peace. Amen. We continue now with the offertory. Offering is taken today to support the mission of St. John's here in this community. You are asked to participate in this work. Please give as generously as you've been given.